What's up, everybody? This is Trey Biddy with hogsports.com, H-A-W-G sports.com. Got a lot of stuff to talk about today. Arkansas is going to have a big scrimmage on Friday, their, what should be their last scrimmage. Uh, we got some college football games happening this weekend. Uh, some big news coming out of the University of Georgia, Arkansas's first opponent. Danny West is also going to join us to talk some recruiting stuff. All that and more on Hog Sports Live. And before we get started, of course, there's plenty of ways to watch and listen. You can always tune in on Facebook Live. Be sure to follow the page if you haven't done so already and throw us a thumbs up if you like the video. Also available on YouTube. Be sure to give us a like there as well and interact with the video and uh, share it with anybody you think might like it. Be sure to hit the subscribe button on YouTube and hit the notifications bell so you're notified anytime we upload a new video. Also available on Apple Podcasts. Now to give us a review, you actually, if you're subscribed, which a lot of you are and haven't given a review, scroll all the way down to the bottom all the way down and you can leave us a five-star review and you can say something nice about us there also also available anywhere else you get your podcast right now hogsports.com is just one dollar for your first month all right let's jump right into it people we got college football this weekend we would have had arkansas versus nevada obviously but everything got pushed back with covid19 pandemic but you've got uh, some interesting games uh thursday you've got uca and uab on espn3 You've got Eastern Kentucky, Marshall on Saturday, SMU, Texas State, Louisiana, Monroe, Troy, Houston, Baptist at North Texas, Arkansas State at Memphis. That's a 7 o'clock game on ESPN. So that's one to tune into. Stephen F. Austin at UTEP at 8, and BYU at Navy at 7. So not just like – I mean, there's not like Power 5 games, obviously. So it's not just a super intriguing slate. That Arkansas State game, UCA on Thursday, Arkansas State on Saturday, there's something there. You can watch BYU play, Navy. BYU is a notable program, obviously. I mean, not that these others aren't, but BYU is the only one that kind of counts as a Power 5 as far as scheduling. Phil Still released his top 25 schedules. As we know, just like everybody else, Arkansas has the toughest schedule in the country. I mean, it's absolutely brutal. Now, there is some good (laughs) names. Actually, let's get into this first before we get into the Georgia discussion because four kickoff times have been announced for Arkansas games. Okay, so on September 26th, let me see here. Where are we at? Okay. So the Georgia game is going to be at 3 o'clock on September 26th in Donald W. Reynolds Razorback Stadium. 3 o'clock is a pretty nice kickoff time for a late late uh, September. It's not a bad kickoff time. I know we're used to a lot of 11 o'clock, but this will be uh, on SEC Network at 3 p.m. The next weekend on October 3rd, it's a night game, 6.30 p.m. in Starkville against Mississippi State, which ESPN FPI has now – Flipped a little bit. Arkansas is just over 50% predicted to win, according to the ESPN FBI Football Power Index, to beat Mississippi State. The first time that's on, you know, this year. So the good news about this one is you're going to have a reduced crowd. You're not going to have to plug your ears, maybe, with the cowbells. I don't know how that will work. But my experiences in Starkville has been, you know, you, you have to stuff earplugs in. There's a chance. There's a chance for Arkansas to get that one. Jordan-Hare Stadium the next week on October 10th. That one has not been announced yet. But the October 17th game against Ole Miss will be at 11, 2.30, or 3 on the SEC Network, the SEC Network Alternate, or another ESPN platform. I should also mention the Mississippi State game is going to be on the SEC Network Alternate. And you get a bye week on the 24th, and then you head to College Station to take on the Texas A&M Aggies for a 6.30 p.m. game at Kyle Field. That's on – is that right? October? Yeah. That's So, that's Halloween. That's – I mean, again, I mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, but are we going to have Halloween this year? How is that going to work out? Can you go door to door and take candy from people? Mm, I don't know about that. You might be limited to some kind of carnival or something. Okay, so the three remaining games are Florida, November 14th, LSU, November 
1st, Missouri, November 28th, and Alabama, December 5th. And those haven't been set just yet. Now, there's a chance that the Missouri game could be moved to November 27th, as it usually has been. I don't know if that'll happen or not, given the nature of things right now. All right, fast forward to Georgia. Quarterback Jamie Newman has opted out of the 2020 football season. A lot of people regarded him as the top transfer in all of college football. Very interesting situation. I don't know if he felt like wasn't winning the job. It's it's interesting timing. I mean, you're like nine practices in, and he opts out. And he's going to focus on going to the NFL draft. But, I mean, first of all, I'm not going to criticize anybody for opting out, okay, if it's, you know, obviously concerns over – the coronavirus and stuff. And there's all kinds of other, you know, reasons surrounding that, not just you, but family members, all kinds of stuff. I know Shamar Nash, um, I believe he said his grandmother passed away from coronavirus. He has opted out. Uh, Shaboise and Juana has also opted out for Arkansas. But Newman, that's a big one. Arkansas so far hasn't lost like a big-time contributor. But Newman, I mean, this guy was expected to do big things for him. And really, one reason you go to Georgia from Wake Forest is to bump up your draft stock. I mean – I don't know that he's much more than like top, you know, a fifth round type of guy right now. So it's an interesting decision, but again, I'm not going to criticize anybody for, for opting out. Now, JT Daniels hasn't been cleared fully from his ACL. So at, at quarterback, you know, you had Jamie Newman, JT Daniels, and you had a couple other guys, a couple of younger guys. They're still four star recruits, but. According to uh, Kirby Smart on the scrimmage, I guess that was Saturday, he said the quarterback play was really sloppy all the way around. So the other guys, in addition to JT Daniels, I assume they're hoping in the next three weeks that he'll be cleared to play for them and be their starter. But you've got Carson Beck, who is a class of 2020, so he's a true freshman, uh, ranked the number nine pro-style prospect in the country and the number 250 overall prospect in the country, 6'4 and a half, 226. And him and Dewan Mathis, a 6'6", 205 pro-style quarterback, ranked number 11 pro-style quarterback in the country. He's from 2019, so he would be in the redshirt freshman class. So you got a couple of young guys who are, you know, very well regarded. Uh, nobody's as well regarded as JT Daniels as a recruit. And, you know, of course, coming from USC, and then, of course, Jamie Newman, who was, again, expected to be one of, if not the, top graduate transfers in all of college football and a Heisman Trophy candidate. It's a big blow for Georgia, in my opinion, unless there's something else underlying where he just didn't feel like he was getting the job that he thought he was getting. I don't know. I don't know, but certainly interesting. Shifting gears a little bit, Arkansas unveils new road uniforms. I've had this sitting in my admin since – July, <laughs> early July, uh, just waiting for them to announce the Darren McFadden road uniforms. I think we all expected that. Now, the way things worked out with the uniforms, first of all, when Chad Morris arrived, Brett Beal had already signed off on the removal of the one tusk and going to the single tusk and uh, I think switching to the pearl helmets, maybe a, a little bit different pants also. So that was all signed off by uh, Brett Bielema. Okay, so when Chad Morris took over, you know, they adopted the uniforms that they were given, obviously. So the next year, they weren't eligible to bring out new uniforms, just an alternate uniform. So they couldn't have two new uniforms. So what they did was they created the throwback 2006, 2007. It's also 2005. They just had different pants, but uh, created that throwback for the alternate uniform and used that for all the home games. They didn't use the, um, the Brett Bielman, you know, the new Nike gig or whatever design for the last uh, for last year. But the the way uniforms were the the white with the tusk and all that. Maybe said Razorbacks over the front. I think they did. I can't remember. Maybe not. Anyway, they, one says Arkansas, one says Razorbacks. Anyway, so now they, they, they have the white uniforms. So they're back to normal. And I would guess they're going to use this for a little while because this was the year when, you know, you're supposed to get new home and away uniforms. So – They'll at least have this this year and then next year and then possibly move to something else. But my opinion on these, I think they're pretty clean. Now, I think a lot of people look at these as traditional Razorback uniforms. Maybe that's a lot of younger people. Arkansas has never had Arkansas across the chest until 2005. That was the first year that they did that. So it is 
traditional in a sense, I mean, you got the Razorback on the shoulders, you got the Razorback on the front hip. To me, those are things that are classic Razorback uniform along with the helmet, of course. And I like the pearl look. I think the, you know, the satin finish, the flat finish, that's kind of played by now. But um, there's a couple of sayings that I like. If you look down, if you buy a new driver and you look down, you know, playing golf, you look down at it and you don't like the way it looks, you'll never hit it good. I also love the chant, I look good, I feel good, I play good, it's all good. Got to like the way you look. No matter what anybody says about fashion when it comes to football, you got to like the way you look in the uniform. And it helps in recruiting. I think these are pretty clean overall. I would be fine with, you know, if it didn't have Arkansas over the chest because the Razorback says that. I mean, everybody knows that logo. It's one of the most iconic logos in all of sports. So you do you need Arkansas over there? I like clean, sharp, clean look, but I'm fine with these. I, I mean, I think most people are. So those were re- released, I guess that was yesterday. Danny West has a good article on the top 10 moments in the Darren McFadden era uniforms, 2006 versus USC. <laughs> you know, these are like, some of these are like just instances. Um, you know, this is just a Dallas Washington's uh, hit. Um, 2007 versus Alabama with Darren McFadden, calls it the workhorse. Hogs win fifth straight, 2006 versus Ole Miss. Just running away from us, 2005 versus Georgia. Slot man comes around in motion. Johnson gives it to that running back. Cuts by some guys, 40, 45, 50. There he goes. There goes McFadden running away from us. Just running away from us for a touchdown. That's my Larry Munson. That's not an exact quote as I'm reading Danny West right now. It's pretty close, though, for me not to remember it for since 2005. That was the year that uh, Pat Dye called Arkansas – uh, called McFadden the best running back to come through Arkansas since um, since uh, Bo and I guess Herschel, yeah, Herschel was first and then Bo. So against so uh, since Bo, Run DMC two thousand seven versus South Carolina when McFadden ran for three hundred and twenty one yards and then Steve Spurrier didn't even give him a Heisman vote. Not one of his three votes went to Terry McFadden that year after watching him go for 321 against him. They beat Alabama in 2006. Alabama State champs in 2006 when they beat Auburn. That was a that was a really good game. I remember that pass to Marcus Monk really opened things up. Auburn was – I can't remember what Auburn was ranked. I think they were number two in the country. Uh, and then game day 2006 versus Tennessee – and then got that wood 2007 versus LSU. Those are the top 10 moments in the Darren McFadden era uniforms. There are a lot of other people that you wore that uniform, but for some reason we call it the Darren McFadden era. Shifting gears again. Had an in-depth look at the offensive line battle uh, under Kendall Browse. I think it's interesting when you go back and look at what FSU did last year uh, under him, you know, because that's really re- viewed as the one-stop for Kendall Browse where – they weren't just prolific on offense. They were still okay, though. They were still pretty middle of, the, middle of the pack. And, in fact, they improved their production on the ground by 50 yards a game with him getting there. They had 736 total rushing yards more than they did the previous season before he was there. And they did go to a bowl game, so there's one extra game there. But when you look at their pass protection, and they, were, they have actually been okay as far as numbers passing – and I think a lot of that is because they were playing from behind a good bit the last couple of years. But last year, he's operating this offense behind, through, and over an offensive line that gave up 48 sacks. Just to put that in perspective, there has not been a single team in the SEC that's given up 48 sacks. One year, when Sam Pittman was the offensive line coach at Arkansas, they gave up eight sacks. I think 16 sacks the other two years. That's a lot of sacks. The Hogs gave up 32 sacks in 2018, which is a lot. Still didn't come close to 48. I think that's interesting. I mean, like, so obviously, if the offensive line can be a little bit better and protect, then Arkansas has a chance. I mean, Rakeem Boyd did a pretty good job running behind that offensive line last year. Not a lot of other backs had success, but but he did. So if that can continue, and we'll talk about Traylon Smith a little bit too here later. I'm going to get to Danny West here in about six minutes, I think. 
Anyway, I think that's really interesting. When you when you look at Pro Football Focus, they ranked Florida State's offensive line last year number 129 out of 130 teams. When you look at what Georgia did last year with Sam Pittman, they gave up 15 sacks to rank second in the SEC, and Georgia was ranked number two offensive line in the country. Brad Davis, now this is actually a pretty good bit of sacks, 27. I mean, it's not a lot, but it's definitely not a little. It's, you know, kind of middle, lower end of the pack in the SEC. And they ranked 10th, well, 10th in the SEC, but there's a lot of schools that were like kind of jumbled up there. Um, but Missouri, so this is how it shook out with pro football focus. I mentioned Florida State was 129. Arkansas was 67. Missouri was 48th. And Georgia was number two. In 2018, when he was at Houston, the Cougars gave up 30 sacks. Still managed to managed, finish third in the ACC, AAC in total offense, 512 yards per game, and first in scoring offense at 43.9 points per game. In 2017 at Florida Atlantic with Kendall Browse there, Al's ranked first in, C, in Conference USA in both total offensive yards, 498.4, and points per game, 40.6. And they gave up just 16 sacks that year. In 2015 at Baylor, they led the Big 12, I believe in the country also, in total offense, 612.2 yards per game, and scoring offense, 48.1 yards per game, or points per game, while giving up 15 sacks, which led the Big 12 in fewest sacks. So even in 2016, when the program was just torn apart with all the scandal stuff, they still ranked third in the Big 12 at 522.7 yards and fourth in points at 34.6 points while giving up 26 sacks, which ranked fourth in the Big 12. So that's a, you know, that's interesting. Like that's fourth in the Big 12, 26 sacks given up. And you like fast forward it's how different things can be to last year with Missouri giving up 27 sacks, and that was 10th in the SEC or in the Big 12. So how the offensive line operates – is going to be big for this offense. I think we're all on the same page that Arkansas has some weapons on offense and should be a pretty significant upgrade at quarterback. Even if the guy's just average, even if Felipe's just average at quarterback, it's still an upgrade, right? So they've got to get things fixed on the offensive line. Myron Cunningham seems like the guy that's, I mean, most likely to start out of anybody. Going to be your left tackle, 6'7", 325 pounds. Put on about 30, 35 pounds since last year. And then you've got Ricky Stromberg is a really solid bet to start at center, 6'5", 11 And that's kind of pushed Ty Clary. Last time we saw Ty Clary, he, I didn't see him take any snaps at center. Uh, he was working at left guard, which has been the most open position. So you've got Ty Clary, Luke Jones, Shane Clennon, all repping at that left guard spot. Seems pretty safe, pretty safe right now that Bo Limmer is going to be your starting right guard at 6'5", 305. Another guy that's put on some good weight over the last couple of years, even going back to his high school years. But just talking with Jonathan Marshall, asking him who's the second strongest guy on the team. He, you know, he's the first. Uh, but he says Bo Limmer is. And that's pretty interesting because they're about three years and nine months apart in age. Limmer's just a redshirt freshman. But they go against each other all the time, so he would know, I guess. So, and then at the other tackle spot at, spot at right tackle, I, I feel like it's going to be Noah Gatlin when everything shakes out. Dalton Wagner's still in there. You know, uh, Brady Latham is probably one of the surprises of camp. I had heard some good things about him last year also and some good things about him, you know, during summer workouts, walkthroughs and stuff. But he might be still about a year away before he starts pushing for anything in terms of being a starter. So, need these guys to step up and – just be better on the offensive line. I think they will be. I think they've got, you know, an upgrade in coaching, you know, not just the overall staff but offensive line, having Brad Davis and uh, having Sam Pittman there looking over his shoulder. So that's kind of my opinion on that right now. Okay, everybody. We've got 200 people on here watching. Appreciate everybody tuning in. Leave us that Apple review. Let me get this off of here. We're going to bring Danny West in. It's been a little bit since Danny came in. You know, everybody he knows, he had a, a, his second daughter just recently. So he's kind of been easing back into work a little bit. But Danny does most of our VIP stuff at hogsports.com, does a great job uh, for us covering recruiting. Once. 
Trey Biddy. First ring. Appreciate you, Danny. <laughs> always. Always. You know, it's been a while since I've been on with you. Over a month now. I know. I was just telling everybody about uh, baby girl Mason and – yeah. Um, you know, you, it's been taking up a lot of time, obviously. And she came a little bit early, gave you all a little bit of a scare. Everything's going good, though, right? Yeah, everything's good. Appreciate you asking. Um, she's in there asleep right now, so I stepped outside for a little bit. Her mm-hmm. mom is in there with her. So, yeah, we're all good on the home front, man. But it's good to be back on Hog Sports Live with you, man. Every time I go out with you anywhere, I want people to know there's at least one or two people that walk up and say, hey, you're Trey Biddy, right, to you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, you're the Facebook guy. And I just appreciate being associated with such a celebrity. Wow. Yeah. A minor, minor no, local. I'm just kidding. It actually makes me sick. When <laughs> a minor <laughs> local celebrity at best, Danny. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Can't go anywhere with you. Yeah, I hear you. <laughs> so let's jump into some recruiting stuff, Danny. Um, All right. There's been a lot, a big shift lately with Keetron Jackson, uh, the wide receiver out of Texas, number 150 overall prospect in the country. There was a actually a lot of people were picking him to go to Arkansas, and then we see a shift, a strong shift about a month ago to Texas, and now that's all come back around to Arkansas. Where are things right now? Why why have so many people shifted? Well, I, I'll put it like this. It wouldn't surprise me if we see another shift. You know, right now I've still got Arkansas as well as everybody else does. But when I say this one can change, buddy, I mean it can change. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, I'm not just hedging my bets here. Uh, we've seen it going from one extreme to the other over the course of the summer. You know, there was a time three, four weeks ago, Trey, that, I mean, I was close to changing my pick and everybody down in Texas was – convinced yeah it's over texas won and here we are three or four weeks later and now it it just sets up in a way that even if he commits to a school at this point i feel like you're going to be sweating it until he signs with one or the other and i do think it's one or the other obviously tcu is has done everything they can to be a part of it but I, i truly think it comes down to arkansas and texas and um i would expect him to try to do something within the next few weeks but again I'm not sure it's going to be over until it's over. And, like, he's suited up running on the field for one of these two schools. Yeah. Well, that's not what I wanted to hear. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, it's not bad news. You would love to be the team that he commits to, right? right. I think it gives you a, a lot of perception uh, points and a lot of momentum in recruiting. It would be good. Take nothing away from it. You should celebrate it if Arkansas is indeed the choice. But at the same time, yeah, this is one of those you need to see it on paper, in my opinion. He's just got, you know, he's a Texas kid, obviously. He grew up a Texas fan. And, uh, you know, here you are, Arkansas. And, and, yeah, you've got a lot to sell. You've got a great offensive coordinator. Obviously, the selling point here for Keytron would be Justin Stepp. He's done a great job with Keytron, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, based on where Arkansas has been as a program lately, yeah, I'm sure Texas has quite a bit of, ammo to use against the Razorbacks right but um, I think it says a lot just that Arkansas is even in striking distance to be honest with you and to be this close and and have it down to what I would assume is two teams says a lot about Jay Step and the job he's done but yeah again man I horse using hand grenades Danny yeah that's a fact (laughs) well let's let's move on to another guy who is solid to Arkansas a Texas kid also Lucas Coley uh, you, you'd spoken to him earlier this week about his performance. He had 147 yards um, passing with a touchdown and rushed for 201 yards and two more touchdowns uh, as they won 24-20. What's, uh, what's going on with Lucas? And uh, he's, he's done a great job of recruiting oh, for Arkansas. Been, I love Lucas Coley, and I don't mind telling you. I mean, he's just one of those guys you can't help but love him. And – you know, I called him Sunday, quick story. I called him. I was like, hey, man, I know you had a huge game Friday night, right? I, I'd like to do an update. Haven't talked to you in a few weeks, so let's do a story. And he was like, ah, my game wasn't that good. I was like, Lucas, let's just do the stupid story, right? <laughs> <laughs> like, just hear me out. Do it. I mean, he threw for 147 and a touchdown. He ran for 201 and mm-hmm. two touchdowns. That's a pretty good Pretty good performance in my book. He was up for play of the week with a 74-yard run. Obviously, uh, they came out with a win. That's the most important part. But they've got a big one coming up this week. You know, he's going head-to-head with Shadur Sanders, Mm -hmm. primetime son. So, 
uh, going to be a tough one against uh, Trinity Christian there. Uh, Cornerstone Christian, Lucas's uh, school, they actually, they're going to be the home team. So I guess there's some advantage there. But, yeah, Lucas has done a fantastic job as, as a recruiter. I mean, it's not just for his current class either. You know, that's pretty rare when you see him kind of take the uh, – take the leadership role for 2022 is earlier this week, obviously Arkansas could contact mm -hmm. uh, and did. So um, over 322 prospects and there you saw Lucas Coley. Yeah. AR time. So, uh, our time. Yeah. Our time 22. So Lucas was out front on that too. He, he put out a tweet. Hey, if any of you 2022 guys want to want to know why we're picking Arkansas, hit my DMS. And that's exactly what you want to hear from your quarterback. Mm-hmm. Danny West joining us again. You can read all of Danny's stuff at hawgsports.com, part of the 24-7 Sports Network. And uh, Danny's been with me for over a decade, does a fantastic job covering recruiting. And, in fact, I don't think he's just the best recruiting writer in Arkansas. Uh, I, th I don't know if there's anybody better around the country. There's some other guys doing it really well, but there's nobody better oh, than Danny West. So, Danny, right now we're sitting – I'm looking at it, and they're sitting at 18 commitments. Mm-hmm. Be nice to add 19 and make it key drawing. But sitting at 18 commitments, how do you see these last few spots uh, filling out? And I know that's a difficult question because there are so many players to me that, and I'm not saying Arkansas is going to have decommitments. I'm just saying across the country, we're going to see decommitments when these players are start, you know, able to start taking official visits and stuff. And um, and it, it, you know, you see a lot of domino effect when when you see a lot of decommitments. There's a domino effect. So it may be a hard question to, to answer, but where do you see these last few spots going, and do you think they'll keep any open for potential grad transfers? Yeah, I would keep uh, one or two open for sure, uh, especially when you look at the linebacker depth, the tight end depth. I think you'd be foolish not to leave yourself some type of room, right? Mm -hmm. But, you know, you asked the question, remaining spots, obviously another wide receiver. If you could get Keytron, I think they would they would be done there. They would feel really, really great about things at wide out. That's uh, been a stellar class so far. Offensively, I think they're done at tight end. Uh, that might surprise some people, but only taking one uh, high school guy anyway. So going back to the thought of maybe hold a spot for a grad transfer, maybe even a Juco guy if you can find the right one. Um, but then, Trey, I would go defensively. I mean, another defensive tackle. We'll find out on September 22nd what Cameron Ball is going to do. I mean, you're talking about another guy there that you're wrestling the in-state school, not just the in-state school, but the hometown school. He's from Atlanta. Georgia Tech is all over him. And uh, I think it's going to be tough. I'm going with Arkansas. <clears throat> Excuse me. Going with Arkansas right now, but – I've got a medium confidence level on Cameron Ball. Again, he's going to announce on September 22nd. So uh, maybe another D-line spot, defensive end, if you could find the right one. I think they're done at linebacker so far. Mm -hmm. And then I would probably wrap up with another DB or two. Gotcha. Yep. So, Danny. Of course, uh, we failed to mention there that Jaquelin Crawford is counting against that total right. two for yes. next year's class. So, so that technically takes up 19. Spot. Yeah, technically right. 19. So, Danny, our man uh, Brandon Marcello, who's our national college football writer at 24 7 Sports, came out with a recent article about uh, assigning reasonable expectations for every SEC team in 2020. I guess it's hey, if you want to have a healthy season, go into it thinking this. But he predicts Arkansas, he says, one one win. Yeah. What, what are your I, thoughts? I would, I would double that, Brandon Marcello. I would go two wins. I think that's reasonable. I really mm -hmm. do. And I would be tempted to push it to three. But, you know, with, with so many intangibles, so many variables out there, I think two. You know, uh, two would give you two more than you've had in the last two seasons. Yeah. Right? I don't I don't hate <laughs> that pretty, take, Danny. Pretty good. I mean. The, the one? The, the two, the yours. Two uh, or, or no, I, even yeah. possibly three. I mean, again, I don't know that people should be getting excited about predicting two or three wins, but I just no, feel no, like I feel like there's right? I feel like they've been misrepresented from a talent standpoint. I do too. Uh, by how how the coaching was and just the culture of everything, just not buying in. And mm -hmm. I'm not saying they have great talent, and people have heard me say this ad nauseum, but 
I'm not saying they have great talent, but I'm just saying yeah. they don't have a complete and utter disaster up there. And I think that they've improved in a lot of areas, specifically at quarterback by adding Franks. And again, if he's just average, that's a significant upgrade. But I think they're going to be better on yeah. the offensive line. And I mean, I think wide receiver, they have some weapons. I think they have some weapons at running back. And defense is going to come down to staying healthy because you've got to have more than just uh, just 11 out there on defense. you really got to have a solid backup group, and uh, I don't know that they have that. But, again, they've got two winnable games early in the season when they should be fairly healthy. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Uh, you know, we talk about defense so often. I think the staff, is, as you know, has been pleasantly surprised with what they found on the defensive line, right? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but the linebackers, Trey, I'm yeah. still worried about that group. i like, really worried about it. Yeah, so, I was going to go into that next, Danny. Just linebacker and tight end on offense are probably the two areas where you're just kind of like, mm. you know. Yeah. It, but especially – I mean, at least at tight end, you've got a guy in Hudson Henry who you feel really encouraged about, and it's just one spot, right? Mm-hmm. Um, although, you know, the depth overall is, is pretty thin. You're very young. They're, they've got some guys with talent that are just super young. And you flip it to the other side of the ball at linebacker, you're talking about anywhere from two to three spots that you you know need to have on the field at different times. Um, heck, maybe even four sometimes if you you know go to a three four look. I mean, who knows what all they're doing? Every time I talk to Barry Odom, it sounds like a new defense, you know, that they're working on. Yeah. So they're going to be very I think multiple. He wants it that way too, I mean, they're yeah. they're really Danny. They're going to be like one guy one play a guy might be lined up at safety and the next play might be lined up at nickel and another guy moves, you know, sense, just yeah. shifting back and forth depending on what the down and distance is we need a bigger guy here we need a cornerback at nickel now you know all that kind of stuff i think was what we're going to see uh plus going to you know occasional three two six look and all that stuff but back to linebacker you know you feel good about bumper pull but he's just one guy and you mm. really don't want to play those guys more than like 70 percent of the time you know you want to be able to get other guys in there to relieve them, and I love Grant Morgan. I love everything about him except for he's still a 5'11", 220-pounder, you know. Um, he gets everything he can out of it, but there are other guys that have great instincts and will hit you and, you know, all that kind of stuff who are 6'3", 240 in this conference. Um, and then Levi Draper, I mean, I can't really I can't really go into much there but sure. um, due to new policies with the university, but um, – I think he's a guy that can help them this year, but we just he's just an unknown. To we me. don't know yet. We right. don't know yet. And, you know, Hayden Henry is a guy that could that can help him also, but he's spent – most of his career has been dinged up. You know, he, he's a guy that's mm-hmm. had a lot of injuries throughout his career. You know, is Zach Zymos ready yet? You know, I, I don't know if he's ready to challenge. Andrew Parker, we haven't heard a lot about him. So, that's a big – to me, linebacker is the biggest question mark on the team. And Pittman was talking about that a little bit the other day. You just – you got to have a guy, you know, who can shuck blocks and, and make tackles. And I don't know if they have enough of those guys. I think – I don't think – it's going to be a problem this year, Danny. I mean, I, there's not an yeah. answer. You can't just go out in free agency and, and you know, add somebody. There's not an answer at linebacker right now. So, it's a little bit scary. And then, of course, tight end is scary, especially, you know, you, I mean, you got Hudson, but it sounds like, you know, they're, they're wanting to emphasize blocking and stuff to him. And I, and I get this also. You know, you don't want to say, you know, you're the starter, you know, at, at tight end when you're a redshirt freshman and, you, you know, sure. you haven't been a starter before. So, I get the idea of pushing and making you earn it, especially maybe if you don't feel like – there is that much competition for you, which is possible. Yeah, and with a guy like Blake Kern, you know, he's been around here for what, like twelve years. Now. Yeah, he's <laughs> my age. Like. So, he's forty. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, going back to linebacker, it just proves, man, it's something you've talked about for half a decade now. The misses in recruiting. Mm-hmm. I mean, you think about two years ago, wouldn't you feel Lakia pretty good Henry. if, if Lakia Henry was here right now, or the Chris kid from uh, Tennessee that chose A and M, mm-hmm. or even last year the Memphis trio? You, we all remember how that one turned out. Yeah. And maybe that wasn't so much a miss, but you understand what I'm saying, right? Mm-hmm. They didn't, uh, they didn't get the top guys on their board, and here you are. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of question marks at that spot, as well as tight end. I mean, you'd feel a lot better had you held on to uh, Brandon Frazier or oh, yeah. Alan Horace uh, throughout the transition last year. You're feeling so, good about it, really. Yeah, feeling pretty good about it. But yeah. 
but you know, no excuses. Can't look back now. Just got to figure it out. And yeah. you know, hopefully that grad transfer portal will, will help them out over the course of the spring, maybe. Yep. All right, Danny. Appreciate All right, you, buddy. man. Good to All see. Right. You. Good to talk to you. See. You. All right, again, Danny West with us, and uh, Danny does a great job covering recruiting. I mean, there's there's nobody like him. So if you want to check out what we got going on at hogsports.com, it's H-A-W-G sports.com, and it's just $1 to try it out for your first month. And the good thing about that also is once you're done – with that first month, you're eligible to get CBS All Access, which is absolutely free, which is a $99 value, and it's commercial free. So that's the app. you got access to tons of shows, movies. Um, you know, you can watch games and all that stuff uh, on CBS uh, All Access also. So it's a, heck of a, it's a heck of a deal. I mean, it's basically – you're basically – getting both things for free <laughs> or one thing for free. Um, so uh, I think it's a great deal, but go on there, sign up. It's a dollar for your first month, or you can take 30% off your first year if you choose to go that way. All right, we're going to continue forward, marching forward. What else do I want to talk about before I get to some questions? We talked about linebackers and defensive end or linebackers and tight ends, which is what I want to talk about. Now I, I mentioned running back a little bit ago and how well Rakeem Boyd did. I'm really intrigued with Traylon Smith right now. Now, uh, Josh Oglesby, Oglesby had a setback. He's the guy that came over from track. Smaller guy, 5'7", 5'8", 174 pounds. But, a, you know, he's capable of running a 10'3", 100 meters. So he is – I've always said this, like, when you're recruiting running backs, it's not okay to root, recruit a guy that's – uh, really powerful, but he's and he's big, but he's not that fast. Or a guy that's not that big, but he's really fast. If you're not that big, you need to have like near world class speed. To me, that's a 10 hundred meters. You know, Trenton Holiday at LSU is a good example. Um, but anyway, Oglesby is a guy that could you know hopefully do some things for them down the road again. He had a little bit of a setback, according to Sam Pittman. Traylon Smith is a guy that is electric, quick. Got all the moves, spin moves, jukes, all that stuff. Got really good speed. And a guy that, you know, he's not huge. What is he, 5'10", 5'9", 190 pounds, something like that. Uh, but he's going to be an interesting change of pace, I think. A guy that loves football, only talks football, hard worker. Everybody you talk to raves about Traylon Smith. So anxious to see what he brings to the table. They need a third guy, though, whether that's Amante Spivey, Josh Oglesby, there's been good reviews on Dominic Johnson, also the freshman. So we'll see how things shake out. I always say this, you know, as a running back, if you're not playing as a true freshman, you might not be that good because you can either run or you can't. We talked about Felipe Franks a little bit. I think we're intrigued with with what Felipe can bring to the table, even if he's not, like, great, even if he's just average. I've said that numerous times. on Across the board, if you're just average – you might win half your games. Now, I'm not saying Arkansas is going to do that, but I, I'm with Danny. I think I think I'm on record saying I think they can get two games. I think people should expect them to win two games. Anything more than that's gravy. I mean, we're talking about a team that has won has not won an SEC game in a long, long time. Arkansas needs to continue on with conditioning, improve conditioning in fall camp, and it starts really, according to Sam Pittman, with with mental toughness also. So, like, he feels that maybe they are conditioned where they need to be, but their mind won't let them get over that hump. Their mind blocks them a little bit on what they're actually capable of. There's a lot of science that suggests that stuff is true, that your mind puts physical limits on you. So you don't hurt yourself or, or things like that. But he's trying to get them to, to push on and uh, gain a little bit more. Uh, first, he wants to get fit, mentally tough, and then the physical toughness follows. The conditioning stuff, he feels like they were kind of worn down towards the end of the scrimmage. Now, they worked them hard. Everybody I've talked to says it was a very legitimate, hard-nosed, ones versus ones, one versus two type of scrimmage. So, And it was 120 plays, 50 with the offense, first team, 50 with the first team, 50 with the second team, and like 25 or so. You know, those are all rough numbers with the second group. And they're going to have another big one on Friday, and they're going to go inside the stadium for the first time under Sam Pittman. So they've worked. Uh, last practice, they actually went indoors, and uh, they're off today from practice. And then on Friday, they will practice inside the stadium for the first time, running a full live-scale scrimmage. It will be the last full scrimmage that they have. 
They might run another half scrimmage, half thud up, which means, you know, thud up, what it sounds like. You don't tackle all the way to the ground. They might run one of those. but uh, And then after, after that, I mean, it's all about getting your legs back, game planning for Georgia, spending two weeks working on Georgia. Uh, that's what's next. So you're not worried about their legs right now. You're just grinding, working, putting them through it. Offensive line getting pretty close. You want to get that offensive line. I mean, the offensive line's been musical chairs ever since Sam Pittman left. So they definitely sound like a group that wants to get that figured out and, you know, has some continuity in there. Okay, everybody. I'm going to go to hogsports.com. We got some VIPs asking questions here. Houston Nutburner says, how concerned are you about linebacker and tight end? Doesn't sound great. We went over that well, Houston Nutburner. Appreciate the question. I know you asked it 29 minutes ago. I got good clap. (laughs) Oh, my God. Have any of your sources (laughs) within the team commented on if they prefer non-athlete students to be sent home from campus? Uh, I, don't, I just read that. I don't even know what I read. Have any of your sources within the team commented on if they prefer non-athlete students to be sent home from campus? Though I haven't heard anybody say that, but some schools have done that. <laughs> Birmingham says, do you think we have a chance against LSU now that they have so many sitting out? Well, I mean, when you look at LSU, they've got like hardly anybody returning. I mean, I think they had five returning starters on offense and defense, and then Jamar Chase opted out, and then that defensive lineman opted out. And that, I, that team's at a three, but LSU recruits. I mean, you can't deny what they've done recruiting. And uh, this is going to be in Baton Rouge, isn't it? No, it's in Fayetteville still. Guys, they're just not I – I just don't think they're ready to take on a team like LSU. Now, can they be more competitive? And that's another thing. Let's talk about this because it's not just about the wins and losses. I mean, it is, but it's not just about wins and losses for this program this year. It's about not getting your ass whipped, you know? I mean, like showing up, showing some competitiveness, fight until the end of the game, and not just kind of just like, oh, this one's over, and just letting it happen. I mean, it, that's a big part of this, of this this year. People want to talk about wins and losses. How about just not getting slaughtered? How about just not getting embarrassed? in your own stadium. That, to me, is is part of it. Now, it may take a while before they get there. I can go back to, you know, Bobby Petrino's first year at Arkansas, and they played – there was that stretch where they played Alabama, Florida, and Texas. And I remember Joe Adams said, you know, after they played Texas, coach, it was like they were mad at us. You know, so I, I, I get playing teams like that. And, you're you know, also if you're – but I don't know necessarily they're just going to throw a bunch of freshmen into the mix. I don't know if that's a situation where that they're in right now because, again, I'll say it again, Chad Morris' staff recruited really well at Arkansas. And I don't think the talent is indicative of, of you know, what the record has been. Wupig Suey Razorbacks 08 says, what freshman have you heard will make significant impact this year? Great minds, Wupig Suey. So – I mean, Marcus Henderson has worked some at the left tackle as a backup. He's not going to beat out Myron Cunningham this year. I don't know if there's anybody that I would say, like, yeah, this guy's definitely going to contribute. Maybe Andy Boykin contributes some on the defensive line. I don't know if there's a linebacker. Possibly Miles Slusher could contribute some. But it's not a situation where it's like this guy is definitely, you know, he's going to push a start. Like last year, I mean, you had you played a lot of freshmen. Shivers45 says, Trey, in your opinion, who should be the starting five on the O-line? Left to right, Myron Cunningham, left tackle, left guard. I'm still going to leave that open. I, I still think that that's just a, a position battle that is unanswered. Right now, if I had to go in, I think I might say Luke Jones just based on some stuff I've heard. But I still think it's wide open, Luke Jones. Uh, Bo Limmer, or excuse me, Luke Jones, Ty Clary, and Shane Clennon. Center Ricky Stromberg, right guard Bo Limmer, who I just mentioned, and right tackle Noah Gatlin is who I think should start. Orchard Blessing says, I know you haven't been able to see much of them yet, but from what you have seen, could you compare or and contrast Boyd and Smith? So I think that 
I mean, Boyd's got a lot of straight line speed. He's got some power. Um, he finds the hole. I mean, like last year's offensive line wasn't very good, but he you wouldn't know it by his numbers. Um, Traylon Smith's probably more shifty side to side. A guy that's got spin moves can make you miss. They're they're different types of backs. Not as heavy. Probably he might Traylon, from what I hear, might be um, faster. Uh, side to side, it's going to be you know a little more shifty. So, Shivers forty five says also outside of bumper pull, who's the most important player on defense? Could be Julius Coates. I mean, like I could say Monteric Brown because I think he's really good. But if you got a guy that can get some pressure on the quarterback consistently, which I think was what Coates is going to be. I mean, everything we hear out of camp is Coates, Coates, Coates. We can't block him. So. For me, like a guy that um, defensive line that can get to the quarterback is going to help both corners, all of the secondary guys out. So I'm going to say Coates. I'm going to say he's the most important guy. I might backtrack on that now that I think about it from a depth standpoint because they do have, you know, Dorian Gerald. They also have Zach Williams. They also have Matteo Soli. Eric Gregory has also done some really good things from what we're hearing. So maybe in that aspect of it, Bumper's definitely very important at linebacker because. If you took Bumper out of the equation at linebacker, then, oh, my gosh, that's really scary. So, factoring in that, what I just said there, maybe I will flip it to Monteric. I just think – I think Monteric has a chance to have a really good season. We also hear a lot of great things about uh, Jerry Jacobs. Um, but if you take one of those starting corners out, I mean, you might be okay. I don't know. I, don't, I, I think Monteric, literally, I think he has maybe potential on the next level one day. That's a hard question. That's a really hard question. I mean, I've changed my mind as I've, as I've thought about it, Shivers. Good question. I'll think about it more, maybe come up with a better answer for you next time. Hawk Shavid says, from the hype around the kid, the coaches sound like coats. Man, you guys are, I mean, see, this is what you get at Hog Sports. These are all VIP subscribers on the Razor's Edge Premium Forum. It's the best community, in my opinion, it's the best community in the country. In December, it was the number one highest trafficked message board in the entire country on 24-7 Sports Network. And I would be willing to venture maybe on any network we had more traffic. So, but it's a great community. It's not just me, Danny, Curtis. It's not just us. It's also these people. Well-thought-out questions, informed hog fans. I mean, you can't get this anywhere else. You may think you can, but the number one thing we hear from people when they come and subscribe is just like, wow, I didn't know all this was here. It's a dollar right now. Sign up. It's a dollar. What are you doing? You're watching this. You like what we do. You like what we do to drive time. You listen on there. Come see what we got for our VIPs. Hawk Savage from the hypes around the kid. The coaches sound like coach could be a one and done kid. We also could potentially get three years out of him. I've heard too many one and dones. I've heard too many one and dones are coming out of junior college over the last few years to think anybody's going to be that. What type of numbers do you feel he need he'd need to get to be gone in one? I mean, like if he were to be like a a ten sack guy, then I think you get you start thinking, okay, well maybe this guy could go. So that's probably the number. But also being good on defense, like being like taking a step forward. Nobody's going to look at you like one of the reasons. You know, some players have been hurt, like uh, Dijon Harris, for example. If Arkansas's defense has been half decent, then he might end up getting drafted. I think that that matters a lot how teams look at. Uh, how, how they look at players by, you know, how good the team is too. Eldo Hog one says, what are the chances, in your opinion, of Henderson breaking in as starting guard at, at game one? If not, then how long before he's based on what the coach said? Well, he's been working at left tackle mostly, Eldo. So, um, I don't think he's going to break. I think he's probably maybe a year away. I think maybe we're talking about him being the left tackle of the future or maybe the right tackle of the future. I mean, you still got Noah Gatlin. So a lot of the way it works with a lot of teams, you got the older, more experienced guy working at left tackle. And then you've got a younger, talented guy working at right tackle. And then when the left tackle goes, the right tackle slides over to left tackle. And that just kind of happens. Texas A&M does that a lot. Or they have, or they did under Kevin Sumlin anyway, Kevin Sumlin, Kevin Sumlin. Uh, they did that a lot under him, but, um, uh, if it's not, if it doesn't work out that way, then I think you could see um, Marcus Henderson ended up being the starter at left tackle in 2021. They like him a lot. 
Raw Hog says, do you like the new uniforms? Should we keep them permanent and stop switching every couple of years? I think the best teams generally, not always, but the best teams usually keep pretty much the same look. The the blue blood type programs. Now, Arkansas isn't a blue blood, obviously. They're a program that's trying to work their way back into relevancy. But for the most part, like aside from Oregon, that's kind of Oregon's thing to wear something different every week. Um, but – I like sticking to something pretty consistent. I understand things change with trends and stuff like that, making minor tweaks and stuff here and there. But for the most part, I wouldn't be opposed to keeping these. I mean, again, I don't know that Arkansas needs to be across the chest. I think when I think of a traditional Razorback uniform, it's everything that they are right now, except for it doesn't have Arkansas across the chest. But I'm okay with it. There's certainly some good times in those uniforms. I just don't like I don't like the like super loud, too much going on, faded look, buzzsaw shoulders, all that kind of crap. I just come on. Just not a good look. Keep it clean, sharp. That's what you want to look like. Recognizable. That's Arkansas playing. That's what you want to see. The Goose CRP says, Can we get a Trey Biddy cutout in the stands for at Razorback Stadium? I'm gonna be in the stadium. I'll be in the press box. It's funny. Sparks Co. says, with the current talent on defense, do you think we'll be forced to play the bend but don't break defense and limit blitzing? I mean, if it's bend but don't break, then that's fine. If it's undersized and scrappy, then that's fine. Anything than the Swiss cheese defense that we've seen the last couple years. Bend but don't break, sure. Houston Nutt had success with that at Arkansas. Houston Nutt used to always say, we got to keep them under 27 points or below and we're going to win the game. That was always his philosophy. Now, a lot has changed with offenses and stuff since then, but that was definitely a scrappy, undersized, bend but don't break defense. And really, Barry Odom has a really nice point about it because you don't want to just like, you don't want to just, um, you know, blitz all the time. Like, you don't want to give up big plays, obviously. It's all about tackling, getting guys down, swarming to the football. When you're watching on TV, which most of you will be doing now, um, I mean, you'd be doing it anyway, but, but you know, there's not going to be a lot of people in the stands. But what you want to see on the frame is just Razorback players flying over the pile, you know, not pulling up, not going, oh, he's got it, pull it up. Because that's how you get in trouble. You got to be a solid tackling team. You got to get them on the ground. You, they're going to pick up plays, obviously. But you got to get them down. And if you do that, then eventually you run into a situation where you do make a play, you get a sack, or they have a penalty, or they screw up in some kind of way. And then they get behind the chains. And that's, that's how you get them off the field. Solid tackling, capitalizing when opportunities are there. That's how you play defense in this day and age for most teams. Most teams aren't just going to be able to just, you know, Alabama you. Swish Musselman says, with increase of positive cases on campus, have you heard any coaches that are concerned about the season starting or are we past that now? I mean, I would hope that when this decision was made to play football this year that they understood when these kids come from Texas, Oklahoma, you know, Mississippi, everywhere else, all parts of Arkansas, everywhere else that they're coming from, California, that they are going to bring – some kids are going to bring coronavirus with them and that these kids are going to want to go out and hang out and – Definitely not social distance. If I remember college, that's not how that's not how kids operated. So, I mean, you have to expect that this is going to happen. Um, I think that Arkansas has m- almost certainly got players on the team. Probably new cases. They're probably having to quarantine players, and I think it's happening all over the country. Okay, not just at Arkansas. The hope is we got three weeks here before the season kicks off. A little over three weeks. The hope is that it's a roller coaster, right? I mean, we talked about the roller coaster. They're going to play football. They're going to play. They're not going to play. There's no way they're going to play football. They're going to play football again. You know, it's been like that the whole time. And so I I think that as you get a handle on stuff, I know that they've really ramped up testing and stuff. As you get a handle on this kind of stuff, then you get a better idea of, um, you know, who, I guess, how to handle things and, you know, just making sure that, People are taking care, but I'm not. Uh, I'm not surprised at all. I don't think any of us should be surprised. I think it's a good thing that they get so many practices and it's spread out as long as it is to make sure that everybody gets, you know, what they need. 
Who picks so Razorback says, glad we're on the same page, Trey. Who are your 50-50 games this year? I've got Ole Miss, Mississippi State, Tennessee, and Missouri. That's what I've got also. You can also add a couple more games that are unexpected. One and a half, plus one and a half wins. Should we hit that? I, I don't think it's unreasonable to expect Arkansas to win two games this year with this schedule. And I think if they do win two games, and I think that it's a pretty safe bet, then they would have won, you know, three of the four non-conference games, not Notre Dame. But I think it's a pretty safe bet they would have won those games. They're capable of knocking off a couple of SEC teams. So I think that's a pretty good step in the right direction. It's not something that anybody should be satisfied or excited about, but they should feel encouraged about. That's the word encouraged if they can get two wins I wouldn't I wouldn't say that three is out of the question I mean there's always a team out there that's not as good as you think they are going to be um, there's always a team that runs into turmoil a lot of times that's been Arkansas in these last couple of years they're the team that just runs into it so that's my thoughts on it folks all right everybody I've gone almost an hour so I'm not going to get to the questions on Facebook, but I appreciate you guys chiming in. Um, that's just kind of how things have gone with the algorithm. Holy smokes, I've got comments. I can see the comments on Facebook. I've got to do it now. I've got to do it. Finally, finally, it's been like three weeks that I've been doing the show and we haven't had any comments. But I'm going to do it now because they've shown up. All right, I'm going to go fast though. Josh Grubb says, is the track guy injured from practice? Oglesby, I believe his name. I was looking forward to seeing some packages displaying his speed. So, Josh, he has a setback. I'll just repeat what Sam Pittman says. I'm just going to say this. The University of Arkansas has been good to us in terms of opening practice when, you know, for certain periods, a certain limited amount of time. But nobody else in the country – I mean, maybe somebody in the country, but nobody else in the SEC is doing that, all right? Nobody's letting regular reporters in to cover practice. Arkansas gets put at a disadvantage because nobody knows who's injured. Nobody has a clue who's injured at the University of Georgia or who's sitting out because of coronavirus or contact tracing, all right? Nobody has a clue. But in Arkansas, I can go to practice and roll call it and tell you who's missing. That puts Arkansas at a disadvantage. So in a compromise – which it's a different situation because of COVID. It's for us, we feel like, you know, we're probably not going to be able to come to practice anymore if we keep reporting on injuries. But I will say what Pittman has said, that he had a setback. But that's all I can say. Actually, these uh, comments are rolling off like they used to. So I'll get to the ones that are still here. How about that? David Stauffer says, I can't, I care what they wear, got to look good. David McDaniel says, Browse has always had a good offense with Franks being mobile. It will help the line. It's a little bit of a misnomer that Franks is like super mobile. He's, he's still a pro style quarterback, a throw first guy. Um, I would not consider him like an elite runner, even though he did have 300 rushing yards and has a 70 yarder. He can run, but he's not a guy that's just like, get out of the pocket, you know, and, and make a play with your feet. Not not a consistent type of thing with that. Now, maybe some design runs, stuff like that. Chris Archer says, Hogs 24 to Hogs 21. Matthew Lowe says, seems like Luke Jones will be at left guard and Bo Limmer at right guard. Probably, if I had to put money on it right now, that's probably where I'd go, Matthew. Stephen Wilson says, can I get your opinion on Georgia quarterback situation? We did that. Justin Ashmore says, love these throwbacks to the McFadden era. I know we don't have a traditional uniform in the Arkansas, but we do have – I mean, Arkansas has that. Arkansas has a traditional uniform, and it's this McFadden look except for without Arkansas over the top. Double stripe down the leg, Razorback on the hip, Razorbacks on the shoulder, red helmet, Razorback on the sides. That's it. That's the uniform. That's the traditional Razorback uniform as I remember it. Even if you go throw it back to like the 64 team, I mean, it's a slightly different shade of red, but it's still pretty much that same look, different Razorback logo and more updated logo. But Arkansas has a traditional uniform. They just haven't gone with it. Alan Wayne Grilly says the Hogs will, su will surprise Georgia. Will surprise versus Georgia. Um, for some reason that is happening. What is that? Go away. All right. Um, J 
Justin Ashmore says, I love them too. It's the best look we've had, in my humble opinion. So clean. I like what you said. It's a traditional look. Paul Cunningham says, defensive front seven are the key. Mark Anthony says, Barry, oh, I can't say that. <laughs> clean up your language, Mark. Joey Patrick says, still not sure why they don't look at Toll at linebacker. I mean, just because – I mean, maybe they have looked at him, but he is like 6'5", 240 or so. I mean, that's that's pretty tall for a linebacker. you got to be able to get low. I mean, they've had tall linebackers. Quentin um, – Quentin – what's Quentin's last name? Shavers? Ah, what's his last name? 1998, linebacker at Arkansas. 6'5", anyway. Robbie Fortner says, good value, folks. It's absolutely a good value. I mean, it's a dollar. It's a dollar, people. Robbie Fortner says, is Toll fast enough to play linebacker? I don't know that – I wouldn't say he has blazing speed. I saw him in camp. He's got a lot of good qualities, obviously, uh, but I don't know that he is, like, going to be a 4'6 guy or something. Maybe not a 4'7 guy either. Cody Hudgens says, sorry, I tuned in late. Who do you think will be the number one tight end? I think it will be Hudson when everything shakes out. And who starts besides bumper pull at linebacker? I think it's probably going to be Grant Morgan. Elvis Scott says, do you think that we could possibly pull off a fourth win this year, like realistically pull off a fourth win? I think, like, you can't believe how lucky you got. You can't believe how the cards fell. It just, like, you run into a team, they've got a quarterback issue, or they got a rash of problems. I mean, that's something we hadn't talked about either. I mean, you could have a team that's, you know, really hit by coronavirus. Um but to me, that is the absolute ceiling is four wins. That's like you win all these, you know, 30 to 50% games. Tennessee, Missouri, Mississippi State, Ole Miss. Mark Harris says, who's your upset pick? Uh, I've gone with Tennessee. I think Arkansas can beat them. It's in Fayetteville. I think Tennessee – I'm not saying Tennessee isn't okay, but I do think they're a little bit overrated. Kevin Venable says, do you think we will see Burks lined up at tight end or H-back due to his size and skill set? I think you're going to see him move around a lot. I think mostly he's going to be at the slot, which is unique at 6'3", 233. But I think mostly you're going to see him at the slot, but I think you'll see him do other things, wildcat, maybe even line up at running back in the backfield in certain situations. I think they're going to do whatever they can to get him the ball. I've been very encouraged what I've heard from Sam Pittman and Barry Odom in terms of how they feel they have to use um, – uh, Burks, and you might be surprised at that for me to say that with a guy on defense and Barry Odom, but Barry Odom schemed against Traylon Burks on offense, um, you know, when they when he was at Missouri, and he has a real high appreciation for him. Uh, Jared Bridges says, "Yep, I just missed linebacker discussion. I've been wanting to info too. Bottom line, Trey Danny discussed that depth is an issue, and you know." Uh, Cody Hudgens says, I expect Shamar Nash to be a factor this year. Do you think – so Nash is – you think he'll still transfer out after this season since he's opting out? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I think it – you know, he has a legitimate reason. You know, his grandmother apparently, from what he said, had passed away from um, uh, contracting coronavirus. So, I can understand, you know, uh, how that would weigh on you, having – you know, watching something like that unfold. Ryan D. Summers says, under the all-conference 19 games, you mean 10-game schedule, how many games will we need to win to become bowl eligible? That's a great question. I have no idea. I mean, first of all, it's kind of looking like maybe there's a chance a Big Ten place starting on October 10th. It's kind of looking like there's a chance. Like they're going to re-vote. So that could change things. Will the Pac-12 follow? Who knows? And if all that happens, then maybe we're talking about, you know, you got to win – four games to get to a bowl game. Who knows? I saw one prediction, you know, based on, you know, Big Ten, Pac-12 canceling their schedules that had Arkansas in a bowl game because, you know, you didn't have enough teams to fill fill things out. So, Cody Hudgens says, thanks, they will seem a little worried about the linebackers. Chad Youngs is nice. All right, we got a lot of discussion in the thread here. If you guys don't mind, just ask me questions. I understand. I mean, you got the answer, but 
It kind of slows the show when I read answers instead of questions. Mm, let's see what else we got. I think D-line may be the strongest position group on the team, and they do have depth. Definitely, I think they're maybe the strongest group on defense. Play like the basketball teams. I can watch good effort any day. I think they should call the Browns offense pace and space, just like they call the Arkansas offense pace and space on uh, in basketball. Rob McCallie says, I thought so when Todd Gurley got hurt. Nick Chubb came in and ran all the way <laughs> to Dallas on us. Nick Chubb's a very good back. He was also extremely highly recruited. Extremely. And it was a running back as a freshman, which is an easier step in. But, yeah, Chubb was a good player. Ray Staber says, how about Bush, Devin Bush? Uh, I haven't heard a whole lot about Devin Bush. I would expect that he's probably, you know, playing in a backup role right now. All right, everybody. I'm going to go ahead and wrap it up, but I'm glad to see questions here. That changes things. So I know next time I can spend a little bit more time and getting to these questions, but we have gone uh, well over an hour. This is the longest show that we've ever had. <laughs> so um, I, want to, I want to say I appreciate all you guys chiming in. We had a lot of people tune into the show today. Um, thanks to our subscribers for your questions, and thank you guys for being with us. We couldn't do what we do without you guys. I also want to thank our free users for coming in and checking out our content. You know, we also uh, – advertising is a big part of our business as well, so we appreciate that. But you really should be taking advantage of this dollar off promo. Again, hawgsports.com. And plenty of ways to watch and listen, of course. Facebook Live, if you haven't thrown us that thumbs up, go ahead and do so now. Hit the follow button. Follow the page. We're almost to 80,000. I want to be there before the season starts. That is the goal. Also available on YouTube. Throw us a like. Um, leave something in the comments. Share it with somebody you think might like it. All that grassroots stuff definitely helps. But also subscribe to the channel if you haven't done so already and hit the notifications bell so you're notified anytime we upload new videos. All right. Now that you're done, the show's over. You're not going to hear anything else. But go leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. Leave us that five star rating. You got to, all you have to do, if you're like, you're subscribed already, you have to scroll all the way down to the bottom. If you're not, it should be there at the top, but throw us that five-star rating and leave a review. Let other people know what they can expect. All of that stuff tremendously helps. We notice a boost all the time. All that stuff helps tremendously uh, when we, when we get all that stuff. So I got a call from Danny West. I wonder if this is anything. Nope. Doesn't look like it. All right, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, we'll be back with you guys on Monday unless something happens and we come back for an emergency podcast if something happens. So this has been Trey Biddy. Uh, thanks to Andy West for joining us. Also, thank you for your questions. We'll catch you next time.